All right, thank you. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Valentin. Despite wearing the one company swagger, I am working for Red Hat. Uh, I'll be talking about the yeah, Dropbooking IPS. There is some overlap with what Marcelo has already talked about, but hopefully I do have some new things to say, or different things, rather. So, that works. yeah. So yeah, nothing new with what Marcel was talking about. Uh, if we care about CPU isolation and no at all, you have a set of CPUs where you really want nothing but user space, uh, user space task uh, happening. So if we then look at what's happening in terms of IPIs, so software visible IPIs, you could have some architecture feature that is interrupting everyone, but you can't really see it. So it's more about what are we doing in a kernel that is causing the interference? So if we look at SMP calls mostly, so in that little graph there, I have the results of tracing a like, simple benchmark that's supposed to represent what happens when you are using CPU isolation. So you have you have skipping CPUs in green. That's the stuff that's supposed to take care of the housekeeping work for the other dead CPUs. And the other dead CPUs are just running a simple boost the loop, always in user space. So you never want to leave user space. And anything that takes you out of it is interference, pretty much. So you would expect that, like this is 20 minutes of tracing, nothing would interrupt those IT CPUs. But as you can see in red, you have IPLs that are hitting those CPUs. And I can talk about what those are. So the first one, or like the major cause of that, is actually pretty stupid. Um, that's so that's an x86 box, and that's the what you're seeing here. You have like those three bars that are the longest ones. It's just the three steps of insertion patching on x86, where you do a step, send an IPI to everyone, do the next step, and you have three steps in that process. And in that case, it's actually a static key that is rapidly being flipped. If you just look at the name, it's supposed to be static. So if it is being rapidly flipped, something wrong is happening. Uh, just digging into that specific case, uh, it's caused by an NTP daemon that creates a socket with timestamping enabled. And it so happens that timestamping in the socket uh, world is gated behind a static key. But seems like that there's really just that NTP daemon that's using that. So NTP daemon does that thing with that socket, destroys the socket. Sometime later, we destroy the socket, disable the static key, and you just keep repeating that pattern. Uh, so we actually have, or we are looking at how to make that better, because clearly this is a case where, yeah, we could make that better. Uh, the other one uh, is actually TLB invalidation. So uh, Marcelo and Frederick already briefly mentioned that. Um, and there are patches out there uh, to defer that. Because clearly here, if this is a kernel TLB invalidation, we don't need to bother user space about it. We could just say, okay, next time you enter the kernel, do this operation that is just for the kernel. Uh, so the two patches I have, or the two series I have listed there, the first one is kind of prerequisite work about making context tracking a bit better. I think it's actually in now. Uh, in 6.0. Six, uh, 6 and the other one is kind of an older one from Peter, which I think was mostly for uh, live patching. So there were some things in there that were actually looking at instruction patching. So if we are patching instructions in the kernel, we don't need to, again, bother user space immediately. We could just say, okay, remember that. And then next time you have a transition from user space to kernel, do the patching. Of course, you do want that to happen as soon as possible, because if you start delaying it a bit too much while you're entering the kernel, you might miss the patching that you needed to happen. Um, Marcelo mentioned that uh, Nicolas also worked on that. So he took that thing of deferring work to the next transition to also apply that to uh, kernel TLB validation. And so in that, uh, in that case that I've shown uh, in there, like it does actually work out pretty well where we don't see any interference anymore. But the point I'm trying to make here is this is pretty much reactive right we just we're taking one specific system with one specific set of workload and we are seeing what's happening if you just do a stupid grep of the kernel tree you have well in there you're going to get like stuff in comments and documentation but you have at least like 400 call sites of smp calls and it's quite difficult to reason okay which ones make sense or i'm really in the scope of situation which one could cause interference uh, which ones are just caused, uh, like Marcel was showing, by user space. So you could say, yeah, don't do that. 
And so what I try to do, um, I started with Coccinel because actually, it might be surprised some of you, but I actually do like Coccinel. When it works, it's really nice. When it doesn't, yeah, okay, you start screaming at the computer. But the idea was, okay, so we have all of those call sites. Can we try and make sense of the ones that we know will not interrupt or send an interrupt to isolated CPUs? So maybe we can uh, realize that, oh yeah, we have this SMP call, but further up the call stack, we actually like checked either a CPU argument or a CPU mask argument, I guess, in housekeeping helpers. And then that got help us reduce the search space. Uh, just doing that, so like explicitly seeing a housekeeping helper somewhere in the call stack, that doesn't reduce the search space by a lot. There's like three files that are removed out of the hundreds. Uh, what I've realized is most of the places that do the right thing do it out of line. So it would be like if you have a CPU mask or CPU argument in a struct, like when you initialize your uh, subsystem or your driver, you will check that against the house, uh, housekeeping helpers. And then in your actual call side, you're just using that. But using Coxinel, I haven't found a nice way to tag that uh, and expunge it out of the search space. So what I've done is the only other option I saw, which is list all of them, try and put them in different buckets and go through each bucket and try and classify them and see if we could find patterns. Could we do something that would apply to each of those patterns? So the first one is just, yeah, you uh, interrupt the CPU because you want to fetch something that is just local to that CPU. I've tried listing different uh, call sites that all have kind of different requirements. Uh, so first one is kind of regular read that is caused by write or reading into uh, CCFS. You read something into CCFS for specific CPU ID with, or specific CPU that's going to send an API to that CPU to fetch the data and send it back to you. So for that one, you can have an argument, well, don't do it, which, OK, it is an argument, but it's not always as easy as that. Um, the other one in there is uh, for perf. So if you have an event that is uh, programmed on a certain CPU, that one, well, you kind of have to do it. You can't really, if you're thinking about uh, deferral, you don't really want to defer it because you do want to interrupt the context. Um, but so these two first, you could say, yeah, it's like it's user configuration. Someone asked for those to happen. Uh, the third one in that list uh, is not really in that category because it is used internally in the kernel. So that's for um, ARM64 frequency invariants. So if you, ha I think that's on ACPI systems, you're going to end up on that. Uh, and you could just send an API to a CPU to collect uh, the counters that are used. It's just like for x86, like uh, APERF and MPERF. You look at what's the average frequency of a certain time um, compared to a fixed counter. And then you can try to okay, see which frequency we've run at and then feed that to the frequency invariance engine. Again, another argument you can have is, well, if you're running CPU isolation uh, and you really care about latency, you probably are not using DVFS. You could just have a static uh, governor in there, but that's the patterns that I'm seeing. Um, and so one thing with those patterns that I think we can improve is if we encode or if we better express the intent of the SMP call, we could, well, first of all, it will make like draping and documentation a bit simpler, but we could also like apply well, some countermeasures to each of those patterns. So if you're fetching data or data for a CPU, you have the case, for instance, well, CCFS reads, uh, you could, it kind of falls into uh, what Marcelo has been talking about. You could just have a thing where you say, yeah, I, I don't do it. Like maybe I return an error or I print a warning, but I don't let that happen. Uh, you could have other cases where, so for instance, for the internal uh, or in-kernel use uh, of this API, you could, okay, do it, but you do log it somewhere. You know, print a one, uh, have a one once or have a new trace event so that you log it somewhere. You say, yeah, I've done it, but in the future, I should really not do it. Can you think about doing this any differently? Uh, if I take the APF MPF example, for instance, um, Tom has modified that not too long ago, and it's a bit better in that you never send an API just since you always log those counters at the tick anyway. Uh, you just record how long ago you recorded that. And then if that's too long in the past, we just return like a, an error value or a known 
default, if that makes sense. So you collect your data um, periodically, and then if you are asked to get it for a certain CPU, you just return the last known good value, so you don't cause a new uh, interference. Another one is about synchronizing against a running task. So that pattern is more about, uh, okay, if you have something that is taken into account when you have a context switch, uh, and for some reason you could have a code pass where you actually modify what is being taken into account. If you have a task running somewhere that could be impacted by that, you have to go and IPI it to like, reproduce the code that happens at context switch. Uh, so a simple example, well, simple, relatively simple example for that is for ftrace. Is Steve here? Oh crap, he is. Um, so you can, with ftrace, ignore events that are generated by certain PIDs. Um, and that is actually taken into account at the context switch. So when you switch to a new task, you say, OK, should I consider this PID or not? Uh, if you update the list of PIDs that are ignored, then to make that work, right now the code just interrupts all of the running tasks and to make or to reconsider that uh, or reevaluate that field. So that's, in my opinion, like a good candidate for uh, the deferral to the next uh, kernel transition or user to kernel transition, right? Because for Ftrace, if it's purely user space, you don't care about it. So for things that match to that pattern, we could say, yeah, okay, I just package that into something that will happen as early as possible in the next user to kernel transition rather than cause interference. Uh, I kind of have a counter example to that one. So that's for REST control. But, um, so that's for x86. I mean, it does a few things, but mostly like uh, cache partitioning. So you could change at red time your partition. And then what it does, it, it sends IPIs to the affected tasks uh, to update because it's driven by a CPU register. So if you change something about the cache partitioning, the running tasks need to be affected by that. So you could argue that you do not want it to be deferred to the next transition. You won't want it to happen immediately. And then there's always the other side of the argument, which is, well, if you care about isolation and interference, you just, and you're using REST control, you should, you should just statically partition your system and then don't modify your cache partitions later on. I think what I'm trying to get to is, for all of those, we probably want either an argument or two variants. One is, I know I can defer it or I can not do it. And the other is we should probably do it when it's invoked, but we need a way of logging those and potentially refactor the code and modify it so that it doesn't happen in the future. And the last category is kind of the catch-all. Uh, I kept modifying the slide to try and split it into different subcategories, but I think it's pretty much just, yeah, there's no magic solution to that one. It's kind of a uh, use case fix. Um, so I've mentioned instruction patching for x86. Um, that, so in a general case, that's not a problem on ARM64 because uh, we can just patch the branch. We don't have to send IPIs. For x86 with this three IPI step, that's a problem. So that's a thing that could benefit from um, the deferral patches only if yeah, we're patching uh, kernel code. The other big one is um, kernel TLB flushing. Um, that is more of a, we don't have an architecture feature to do it for us, so we're just IPIing all of the CPUs and we have the per CPU uh, instruction to do it. Uh, again, for ARM64, there is an, an instruction that we do it for the whole system. Doesn't mean it's better for like interference and latency, because it is going to impact the isolated CPUs, but at least on the IPI setting front, we're a bit better there. Um, and then, yeah, general synchronization. So, for instance, um, for CPU cache tuning and shrinking, uh, and all the places, there are things where we want to interrupt all of the CPUs at once for synchronization. Uh, for synchronization, I'm not exactly clear on why is it required for that specific cases, but it's like a pattern that is spread in quite different places. And that's, again, I haven't found like a nice argument where you can say, yeah, there's a genetic rule that applies. Some of them are, yeah, if, even if that CPU is isolated, we do need the thing to happen. Uh, in some cases, uh, not. So I don't really have a solution for that one. Right. Like I said, ask Santa and wish that someone can fix it. 
Um, I think that's pretty much all I have. So if there are any questions or comments, that's the moment. Oh. <laughs> that was painful. That was too bad. Oh, this isn't going to work for me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, no, I mean, I unfortunately, because I was putting out some fires, I came in <laughs> uh, late. So on the deferral side, I mean, I didn't get to see a chance of seeing what the mechanism is to acknowledge or, I mean, to um, to call this stuff. So, in other words, I'm perfect. I, I, it totally makes sense. So, like, if you had a, some sort of uh, interface or API where I can just say, execute this on all non-user space applications, if you could really make it sure with all the race conditions between user space and that, so I could say this will go through and set an IPI, or, or I could say, I guess you would have to say anything that's in user space, call this now when it gets back. And then you set that, and then you say, um, uh, for everything else, interrupts and IPI too. I take it that's what you have? You have an interface for that? Uh, so that's the default patches that originally were from Peter okay. uh, and uh, Nicholas have, has picked up. Because for at least on the F-Trace side, I'm perfectly fine with that. I can't speak for the other aspects of the kernel, but yeah, it makes, I mean, um, I had what you said, your description of what the event um, PID, what write does is exactly right, which I went back and looked at the code and said, oh, I, I commented it pretty well. So I guess. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, because I forgot what it did. I, always, I don't comment for you, I comment for me. Because <laughs> I always forget what I, what I did when I write code. Um, but no, yeah, I'm perfect. I have, I'm okay with it, uh, the approach. Okay. So I don't really have any other comment. Who else? Yeah, <laughs> well, right upside down. Uh, so you have any thoughts on uh, how this might apply to RC because there's IPIs flying around for uh, um, expedited? Yeah, so I looked at um, RC buyer. Uh, the thing is, let me try and remember what I looked at. Um, I think you skip... Well, yeah, you skip CPUs that do not have uh, any callbacks and queued. Right. Um, but then if they have any, I think you do IPI them. I think that kind of falls in the, you need a, a specific solution for that. So, um, yeah, because you do inter end up interrupting isolated CPUs if they have callbacks and queued. I don't know if you could actually just directly uh, send an IPI to the uh, offload thread rather than directly interrupt the isolated CPUs. I know that I have a note somewhere that I should look into that. But that's like, yeah, that's specific to RCU by, yeah. But, and that's kind of, that third category is, yeah, it's going to be solutions that are specific, unfortunately, the, the call sign. Yeah, the expedited IPIs, expedited RCU also uses IPS. Yeah, so those I and just then, said, yeah, that, that doesn't then, make sense to have those in like yeah. isolated oh, scenarios. I'm just so. making you aware, I guess. <laughs> You probably looked at it, but the expedited RCU uh, and then barrier, like you said, and then there's also uh, there's emergency IPIs that go out if CPUs are not reporting question state. But that so is that just for um, stall detection or is that no, the forcing for, uh, the question state? I think it's in certain configurations, and uh, the comments say like it's used to loosen things up a bit if the CPU is. Constantly spinning in kernel mode. Uh, okay. Well, which shouldn't happen when you have your user space starts spinning as well. Have a look, thanks. Okay, sounds good. Um, general sort of question. Since uh, I seem to actually have found I mean, lots of stuff to potentially fix, or at least you understand. I guess lots of the sources. What will be the next move? Uh, would you uh, personally start maybe introducing the um, 
more annotated version of the calls just to be sure that one fed I mean catches everything or would you I don't know, start fixing the problems that we already know are problems yeah so uh, I think I'm gonna do both because <laughs> <laughs> um, there's clearly like like uh, the NTP thing like with the tati key being flicked repeatedly that's something that that's a button but like that, that needs fixed uh, that needs fixing um, but then like if you want to fix the thing with uh, like F trace for the PID write. Uh, that's a bit more convoluted because we do need the uh, context transition default patches. Uh, I think I might just start with, well, probably have a chat with Marcelo and look at just for instance for the data fetch, see how we can go about that. Uh, I could do like just this annotated version and then merge that somehow with what Marcelo has been doing and, and get forward. And do you think we can do anything to try to f flag like uh, new uh, introduction, new I don't know, patterns that uh, can actually introduce problems? So I like, recognize uh, when mm. that, that happens. I'm, I'm not sure how that might work. Yeah, um, so I think I, uh, there's still, I still want to experiment a bit more with uh, Coxinal on that front. Um, but yeah, I don't know how far I'll be able to go on the because I mostly used it to try and reduce the search space. I haven't used it to try and do the category or the classification. Well, I did briefly, but I think I could get back to it and try and see uh, if I can at least like get it to maybe warn about, oh yeah, you should double think about what you're doing because that could cause an interference. That would already be a good start, I think. I think of it, maybe, I mean, if we reintroduce the new, uh, let's say, API with the uh, I mean, where you have actually have to declare uh, what you're using APIs for, and then maybe if that's the only API one can use, so we basically kind of uh, remove the mm, generic right. one. Yeah, so you are forced. Then to you are forced to use it, and yeah. then we can probably evaluate better. I'm not sure if. Yeah, the thing is, like for that third yeah, catch-all category, it's kind of like how yeah. do you really categorize that? So, but yeah, that's a good point. So um, for the bucket one, I think what we did was to have a demon. Not sure if you've seen the demon. Yeah, demon I've seen that it's thing. It's kind, of, yeah. <laughs> and I think maybe the uh, the feral patches would handle that case, you know. And I, they, I, like in that specific case, they would, yeah, because actually the one patch from Peter, I think, it was for um, live patching, and I was specifically about instruction patching. But it does feel like in that case that it shouldn't behave like that. Like yeah. a static key shouldn't be flipped several times a minute. Yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is that I saw some uh, infrastructure on x86, new infrastructure to do uh, remote MSR reads. And um, I think that maybe you could handle the uh, uh, handle some cases through that interface. And I'm not sure whether that interface would uh, inflict any latency impact but that's yeah i think that's another argument is if you can implement the mechanism without an api do you actually still want that thing to happen on an isolated cpu because it might yeah. not be, like it might be lower interference because it doesn't cause an ipr but it could still cause interference right so maybe you actually still want to have an smp call but that you know will not will never better the isolated cpus I think. I think there is an API when <clears throat> you install a perf event on a running task. And for that one, I don't think you can use any deferral, for example, because perf events also. Yeah, you want them to happen in the context space. of the task. Yeah. I think that one falls more into like, yeah. don't target tasks exactly. that are isolated. That's, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, it doesn't make sense, you know, for perf anyway, because perf is uh, when you when perf runs on a CPU or for a process or something, it's going to run NMIs. It's going to be interrupting it constantly. That's how it profiles. Yeah. It interrupts, so it doesn't. It's like, yeah, I don't think we care. <laughs> I think it's one of those. Don't do that if you care about it. Yeah. yeah. But maybe we still have the option of like using a, a different. Um, 
interface that does the same thing, but at least that documents that, yes, we do want uh, that thing to explicitly happen all the time. Yeah. And maybe log it somewhere. Well, no, want. it's not that we don't want, we, it's not that we want it to happen all the time. Oh, it's just that it's, super, it's just how like, it's supposed to work. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're going to make sure we don't send an IPI to it, but once we enable perf on this task, it's going to send, it's going to trigger a bunch of NMIs on that task. Yeah, it's yeah the, the frequency, um, the cycles, events, but there are some software events, uh, even trace points. Well, that then yeah. So basically, if you enable tracing on yeah, so it now it depends on what you're enabling yeah, on right. on that. So, um, but a lot of that. Okay, I only use perf. I don't use perf for trace points. Yeah, so but, that's why to me I don't care. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it's kind of a corner case. I guess there's really no, I mean, there's not many cases where we really uh, need an API on a user space. I think the whole thing is like, what's the overhead that, the whole problem with context, the, the switch between context, between user space and kernel and tracking that is you have to hit the fast path. And any little change you do there is noticeable. And the whole pushback of the re the doing it is the overhead. So you can actually think meltdown because meltdown caused the overhead of system calls so drastic that um, as the S trace, uh, the S trace maintainers once said, after meltdown, the performance impact of S trace has shrunk tremendously. <laughs> but other than that, um, uh, I'm interested to see what the, uh, do you have? Um, uh, there's uh, a link actually on the slides. For uh, I think the, the second one in there, that's the original link, uh, the original patches from uh, Peter. Well, uh, what, the thing from Nicholas is somewhere on GitHub, I can send you the, or put the link somewhere. And, and they have the um, uh, performance impact on it? Uh, I haven't, maybe Nicholas does. Okay. But yeah, he's not that ahead anymore, so. Um, from the isolated CPUs, there shouldn't be a really visible performance impact because um, we take advantage of the uh, context tracking RCU uh, atomic fetch. Well, actually, that's true. This is only for when that's compiled. The, the yeah. context fetch is compiled. It's in. only for it's those who send IPIs. Yeah, so basically, if you care about um, you know, isolated CPUs, you enable this, which means that you don't, like, you're going to, I don't want to say you don't care, but You'll take the you'll you'll take the sacrifice of the system call performance um, impact due to tracking context uh, for this. But for those that don't care or that care more about um, uh, system call performance than isolated CPUs, this could be turned off. Is that yeah, I think if you like, yeah, if you don't have the hertz full, that's not compiled in. Yeah. Okay. Just to clarify for me, like, so basically what this is going to do is it's going to defer all SMP calls by default and then specific sites will. So, uh, no, the, the way the, uh, the series is at the moment is you have very specific users of the uh, SMP calls that can be deferred. So okay. uh, with Nicolas, I think it's just instruction patching and the kernel TLB invalidation. Okay, so only those will be deferred. I mean, that's the state of the thing at the moment, but we need to like, know what we okay. want to do there. I see a lot of similarities between this and the color seal lazy stuff in the sense, something similar, like we want to encode the intent in the API. Thomas said, uh, don't add more APIs. No, I, I don't know if that really applies to this because SMP call is more specific to use case maybe. I don't know, Thomas. <laughs> no? yeah. I mean, the, the, the instruction patching, the static key one, yeah. Okay. Um, the second one worries me more. It'll be invalidation. 
Um, the or case is where you actually have to do that immediately. Otherwise, you end up with stale TLPs, which is outright dangerous. Remapping is one of the pieces you really need to do that immediately, because you can't have um, the cached uh, stale TLB entry on one CPU, which belongs to the same <clears throat> VM space, because it's going to uh, fill in something which it shouldn't. Mm. So you really have to be careful about the TLB stuff. That's uh, a dangerous area to, to, to walk into. So for the static key patching, yeah. I mean, why do we need API, APIs for that at all? Uh, so I'm not extremely familiar with XTC because you know, but, from but we, we, we do not API on static key changes, so at least not to my knowledge. We shouldn't. Is that because of the text, text poke? Yeah. Okay, so the APIs IB is, um, I think that's just to insert um, memory barriers. Uh, for so the way uh, context track or the way we modify text is the breakpoint where right you, and you have to make sure all CPUs see the same state. So we just send we only send the IPI to all the CPUs to uh, set, to make sure that they all see the yeah. same state. Do we really have to? Well, we don't have to if if, those, if the kernel is in user space or I mean if the CPU is in the user space. It's only because it's live kernel patching is only for kernel space. So when I mean, I believe I'm going to assume that it's a memory barrier when you go from user space to kernel. Yes, that's 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 fully synchronizing. So we don't need to. So if we could prove, or if we we if after we make the patch, if we say this is in user space, we know we don't need to send an API to it. In fact, yes. we don't even need to do anything. As soon as it goes in, it does, actually does. It's just a memory barrier. That's all we're doing is we're. We're forcing a memory barrier on all the other CPUs. That's all we're doing. Just trying to figure out whether we need it at all. But... No, it's you're 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 modifying code, and the whole idea is, um, if if um, it's cache lines. Uh, so if the CPU pulls in half the instruction, not the other half, and then executes it. It will crash. It will do a general. It will, it will do a no, 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 no. This is that's after. No, this is modifying the code. We're we're actually it's like after after the function tracing, static calls. Anytime you actually modify the text, what you do is the way it does is um, we put a breakpoint at the first at the first so byte byte instruction. First byte we put a breakpoint. So anything that hits it, because it's a no op to an instruction or it's when we're changing something, we just emulate what we're changing. So at the breakpoint, we change everything. But we have to make sure everything sees that breakpoint. So we send an IPI so they all see the breakpoint. And then we modify the last four bits. This is where the tricky part is. We can't let anything see those last four bits or four bytes. I mean, if anything sees those other four bytes without the first one updated or anything mixed in between, it will crash. So we update the four bytes at the end, send IPI. So now they all see the same four bytes at the end. Then what we do is we switch the uh, breakpoint back to the original, the next, the new instruction, and then we send the all API so we know everything's synchronized. Now, if the thing is in, if if something's in user space, we don't care because it's not going to execute that kernel code. So there's no reason to send the API. And as Thomas just said, the switch from user space to um, kernel space is the synchronization point, and it will see whatever we did at the time. You should see. Uh, oh yeah, I guess as long as it's a synchronization point, we don't care. Right. And yeah, I have to read back on the internal but it should work. Once it sounds to me that the point is once we find um, whether or not it's if it's a synchronization point, it sounds like it could be delayed, and we don't need to send an IP for isolated CPUs. Yeah. What? Or for yeah, for for any CPU that's running. <coughs> oh, that's in. Yeah, right. Well, you can't just, can't just delay it. No, you can't just delay all CPUs. You have to, but you could delay anything that's in user space. You can't just ignore those which are in user space. Yes. You just have to make sure on kernel entry that you synchronize. So, that sounds the same so thing that, that needs 
that needs some entry changes because you uh, it might come in during patching so we, so which makes the whole del, do not IPI erase uh, thing so you have to have some um, uh, something ensure that this doesn't get into into a race to hell uh, but it should be doable well i was thinking that the context um the stuff that we use like for our uh rcu full and stuff the context tracking uh handles the synchronization to say that yes this is at this point we were in or we're definitely in user space at this point or you know i don't care if we are just or we're transitioning but we were i do something and then I want to make sure that I was in user space after I did something, kind of like an RCU type of thing. Uh, yeah. And then I don't care. After this point, I don't. As long as there, we're in, our, if we're in user space at any time after this point, I don't. I don't need to do something else now. So, yeah, yeah. It, it should work, but it needs some thought. Okay, or verification that it does. Work. There's <laughs> some dragons as always, but yes. it should just work. Yeah. Uh, the TLB and validation. Yeah, that's that that one. That one I have no idea how to do. <laughs> so, the, the, I mean, the the thing is, if you know that, I mean, we are trying anyway to be careful about not um, IPIing to CPUs which do not have the same um, H tables loaded. Uh, in some of the calls, yes, there are some that just do like API everyone. Yes, uh, there are some reasons why you want to do that. Um, that's a tough one. Don't change page tables. And and a just a question about the TLB thing. I'm saying for right now, we're, are you just care about x86, but what about other architectures? Uh, so I've only really looked at x86 and a bit at ARM because that's what I actually know. Uh, so on ARM, uh, it's with an oh, Obviously, I'm looking here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I forgot uh, there's like a I think TLBI instruction. So, yeah. and that affects the whole, well, I was yeah, going to say the whole system to make it short. Yeah, the whole system. So my question is, with TLB validations, is page tables enough? Don't some architectures with tagging and such allow TLBs to have uh, page tables for different, or I mean, or is it only every time you change the page table, does it always validate the entire it, TLB? It depends on, uh, it's very architecture specific. Yeah. Um, and even on, it depends on, uh, even on X86, it depends on whether we can, or we have uh, just uh, page tables, or we can use assets. Mm -hmm. That changes the game as well. Because it sounds like there, you never really know what's in those TLBs. Kind of. It sounds like kind of know. Uh, but assets make it more complex because. Uh, it was switched out. If it switched to ACID space and the ACID is still valid, it still might be cached. So that makes it even more nasty. It's all a minefield. Right. More time. Yep. <laughs> right. Thank right. you, Ventan. We are out of time. Thank you.